46. When we left off last week, when George was speaking, um, we left off where Joseph revealed to his brothers who he was. His brothers thought that they were standing before the prime minister of Egypt. They thought their lives were over. They thought um, Joseph was going to kill them. And then in grace and mercy, Joseph reveals himself to them, and he then invites them to come and live with them. He says, brothers, why don't you go back home? Bring my father, bring my, brother, uh, bring my brothers and all their families. Bring them back and live here because there's going to be a famine in the land for several more years, and here there is food, so why don't you bring everyone back? So this morning in our text in Genesis 46, Jacob is about to be reunited with Joseph. 22 years of his life, he thought, Joseph was dead. He thought Joseph was gone. 22 long, hard years. And now the brothers have come back and said, no, Joseph's not dead. He's actually alive. And he's actually a ruler in Egypt. And he's invited us to come and live with him. 22 long, hard years. And we pick up the story in Genesis 46, verses 1 through 7. It says this, so... Israel took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba, and he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in vision of the night, and he said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here I am. Then God said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Then Jacob set out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, their little ones, and their wives, and the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt. Jacob and all of his offspring with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, all his offsprings he brought with him into Egypt. Years ago, there was a black pastor in Georgia. He loved his wife, and he also loved his mama, who lived in Alabama. One day, he received word that his mom was sick and dying, and he left his wife and his family, and he took off toward Alabama to take care of his mother in her final days. And sure enough, when he got there, she was at the final days of her life, and she took care, he took care of her, and she died with him. And after he buried his mother and took care of the affairs of the home, he headed back to Georgia. His soul was in deep pain and grief, and God took him through that experience. But when he got home, he couldn't find his wife anywhere. Because while he was gone his, to take care of his mother in Alabama, his wife had died. And now he had to go through the burden of burying his wife as well. So deep was his pain that he wasn't sure if God would be able to see him through it. But sure enough, God did. As the statement goes, there is no pit so deep that God's grace is not deeper still. And after some time, the pastor sat down and he wrote a hymn. It's like many of the hymns that we sing. It's not just songs that are written because they sound nice. But they were written through times when it was forged through the pain of one's life. And this pastor wrote these words. He said, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Help me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm and through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hands, precious Lord, lead me home. See, more than likely, all of us have or one day will come to those points in our lives where it feels 
like it's too much to overcome by ourselves. And at those times, like this pastor sings, we don't need answers. We need the precious hand of God to hold our hands. You don't have answers. All you Out of nowhere, there's this incredible iceberg of pain that comes into your life. You know, what's fascinating is I actually wasn't planning on speaking from this text because this text has nothing to do with Joseph and we're studying Joseph's life. But I was looking at Genesis 50, but as I was reading, I came across this passage and it just started speaking to me and just ministering to me this week. And so I just started putting some notes down together about what God was teaching me here. All of us have faced icebergs. Let me just share with you my last two weeks. Two weeks ago, I was sitting with a friend whose wife just left him. No reason at all. She just said, I'm done with the marriage. I'm gone. And left. And so I sat with him day and night one day and just grieved with him. That same weekend, I found out that a friend of mine who had the opportunity to minister with um, several times. We were part of the same church in Oklahoma City. Um, he was sick, um, was going through dialysis. His kidneys failed. He passed away. His funeral was last Saturday. Grieved with them. One of the kids that I was a youth pastor of, his mother, driving to the funeral, gets hit by a car. She flies out of the car, uh, three ribs broken, spine broken, She's in a hospital in Oklahoma City, and I grieved with them. I got to see them last night. And then a family, dear family friend of mine, um, a family that basically became my second parents, their oldest son, my age, 38, passed away this week, um, grieved with them. And then this week we heard, if you're on Facebook, you heard that Roji, who plays guitar with us, his, his grandmother passed away. That's just what's been going on in my life in the last two weeks. All of us in this room, we have icebergs that we face. We have pains and experiences in our lives. It could be the unexpected death of a loved one. It could be a financial disaster. It could be something that is inexplicable, unexplainable, unwarranted, unavoidable, unwanted, innavigable. You can't get around it and God takes you right through it, that painful occurrence. And Jacob is facing an iceberg. His sons have rediscovered Joseph was alive. His favorite son that was lost to him is now back after 22 years. And he finds out by divine providence that he has to take his children and his children's children, a total of about 70 people, and pick up their stuff and move from Canaan and go all the way to Egypt and resettle there. And God comes to him and says, Jacob, don't be afraid. He's scared. He's scared out of his mind. And it's not hard to figure out why. One, Jacob's old. You discover with old people that as they get on with life, they don't like surprises. They they like to have things ordered. They like things a certain way. You don't want to be 80, 90 years old and be told to pack up your bags and move to another city. I think about Charles, wherever he's at, and just imagining God one day speaking to him saying, Charles, move to Brooklyn. And Charles would be like, no way, right? (laughs) Charles is our oldest guy here, or he's the grayest here. So, um, (laughs) um, but that's what it's like. It's God saying at at a stage in your life, move. Old folks have a way of liking and doing things, and they work too hard and too long to have things change on them this late in the game. And here's Jacob having to pack up and go to Egypt. That's tough. Jacob's scared because Egypt is a pagan place. 
Egypt is contrary to everything that Jacob knows about God. In Egypt, there's, God, there's a whole pantheon of gods. There's a God to the sun. There's a God to the Nile River. There's a God to different insects. There's a God to amphibians and reptiles and snakes. And it's a frightening theological mess. And now Jacob is being told, take your family into the middle of that. It's scary. Egypt is also a godless place. Jacob, up to this point, was living in Canaan. And Canaan was a bunch of tribes. You had the Hibbosites there, and the Hittites there, and the Gashites there, and the Jebusites there, and all these people doing their own thing, but they kind of lived on their own and didn't bother anyone else. But Egypt was a centralized power, and you had one guy in charge, and that guy was treated like deity. If he, on a bad day, decided to chop your head off, no one was there to question him. He could do whatever he wanted. That's terrifying. Egypt was a place where his grandfather almost died. You guys remember the story? Abraham and Sarah go to Egypt, and everyone's looking at Sarah. It's like, wow, she's beautiful. And Abraham gets scared, like, hey, Sarah, don't tell anyone you're my wife. Tell them you're my sister. And he, they almost died there. Egypt was a place in Genesis 26 that God tells Isaac, don't go to Egypt. That's not where you belong. But there's another reason that Jacob is fearful. Almost 100 years earlier, God gave a prophetic word to his grandfather, Abraham, about this prophecy that would happen to the people of Israel. And you find that prophecy in Genesis 15, verse 13. It said, The Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. And they'll be servants there. They'll be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. He doesn't understand, but there is this prophecy years ago that his people will grow up in a pagan place. And that's scary to him. Everything inside of Jacob wants to say, I want to stay here. I want to die in Canaan where I'm comfortable, where I'm safe. And God comes to him and says, you're going to Egypt. Don't be afraid. Jacob had to face icebergs. You know, what's amazing about the story of Jacob is he had to face icebergs his entire life. He faced it when he was young. He faced it when he was getting married with his extended family. He faced it when he came back and he thought he lost Joseph. He faced it in the midst of all the problems that he had with his other kids that George expounded on last week. He faced icebergs. And here he's at the end of his life with just a few years left to live and there's another iceberg in front of him. You know what that tells me? You're never too old to go through God's school where he's shaping you and molding you and forming you. You don't graduate from this. You don't say, hey, I've done enough. Because God's plan and purposes for your life is so much bigger than what you think and what you know. See, even in our church, even in this room this morning, we have folks that have lost loved ones tragically. That's a serious iceberg of pain. There are people in here that have experienced Incredible hardships at their jobs where they want to quit, but they just don't feel like the timing is right. That's an iceberg of pain. There are others in this room or in our church that have had reports from doctors that said, you're sick. And it shocked them. It rocked their world. That is an incredible iceberg of pain. Some of you have been in relationships that have ended terribly. Some of you are dealing things, with things like depression and discouragement and bitterness and heartache. Some of you are in marriages that are incredibly hard and you wonder if it's worth fighting. We have one of our own, Brian, who's going through rehab and we've been praying for him. And every week he texts me when I forget to text him and he checks, checks up on me to see how I'm doing. We 
have icebergs that we face as a church. We have icebergs that we face as families. When God says, count it all joy, whenever you encounter various trials, he doesn't say, count it all joy if you go through trials. See, this is not an elective, so that's something you can skip out on. It is a required curriculum in life. All of us are going through or have faced unavoidable pain. How do you go through that? Do you know what we generally do? We have some bad responses. We can be like Job's friends. You guys remember them? He was going through pain, and they had this great counsel that they wanted to give Job. Job, you're going through pain because you've sinned in your life. That's why you're going through pain. You're going through hardships because you're a screw-up, and that's why you're suffering. Do you know what God tells Job at the end of the book of Job? He says, Job, would you offer sacrifices for your stupid friends? That's my translation, but that's what he says. He says, would you offer sacrifices for the unwise counsel, the wicked counsel of your friends? Because that is dumb counsel. And if you have an idea in your head that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people, then you have a Bible that's going to conflict with you and you have a life of reality that's going to conflict with you. That's not true. Bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. See, another response that we have is we get angry. We get angry toward others. We get angry toward God. That was what the problem Job faced. He thought he was living such a good life that only good things should happen to him. And so he was angry. And in, Genesis, in Job 37, God challenges him. And you know what he did? He doesn't give Job any answers. Here's what God does. He gives Job 70 questions. He just goes question after question after question to Job. Questions like Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Job, do you know why deer give birth at a certain time of the year? Job, do you know where snowflakes come from? What about raindrops, Job? Do you know where raindrops come from? How about the fountains of the deep that spring up into the ocean? Do you understand that, Job? God's like, you don't even understand snowflakes and raindrops, and yet you're talking about me and good and evil. Here you are challenging me, and you don't even see the big picture. I love the ending of the chapter. God asked Job, Job, have you ever wrestled a hippo, if that's, if that's what a behemoth is? He said, Job, have you ever wrestled one? And I love God's statement. He goes, do it. You will not do it again. God was saying, you think you're so tough. You can't even mess with a hippo over here. A hippo will waste you in a second. And here you are challenging me. You know, Job never gets an answer. But after God's question after question, here's how Job responds. He says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now I see you. Therefore, I retract all that I have said, and I repent in dust and ashes. You know, what's amazing is, Job never found out why he went through what he went through. We know because we read the story. But God never gives Job an answer because he didn't need answers. He needed focus. Another thing we do is we get anxious. We get like Peter when he's walking on water. God tells him to walk on water and he's experiencing this miracle of walking on water and yet he turns around and he sees the winds and the waves and he gets anxious. Scripture says be anxious in nothing. You know what that word Greek, in, what that word anxious means in the Greek? It literally means in all directions. That's the way we get sometimes. That's why Paul, when he talks about the armor of God, he talks about putting on shoes of preparation for the gospel of peace. See, the Roman soldiers had these boots that had these huge spikes in them. So Paul is saying that you've got to put on shoes that won't let you move. That means that whatever circumstances I go through in life, I trust him. I trust him. I trust that he is faithful. I trust that he would take care of me. See, I've seen followers of 
Jesus crater and Satan get them because of this. Things are going well and all of a sudden this iceberg comes and they get anxious and they look around and the peace of God doesn't guard their heart and doesn't guard their mind and they get anxious and they don't trust God. They panic. But God says you've got to put on peace. You've got to trust that I'll take care of you. See, another thing we do is we treat it lightly. The book of Hebrews says don't regard lightly the discipline or the reproof of God. A lot of times we treat it lightly. We say things like, well, accidents will happen. Listen, if I'm going through great pain in my life, I don't care how bad the pain is. You telling me accidents will happen does not comfort me. It does not bring me any comfort at all. You might think it exonerates me and it gives me immediate comfort that God is not responsible, But when I walk away, the question that comes to my mind is, then who is responsible for this universe? See, the Bible doesn't try to exonerate God in pain and heartache by saying it's an accident. The Bible gives us another problem. God says, I'm in charge. I might not be pleased, but I'm sovereign. I am not confused. See, now I have an immediate problem of how God would let bad things happen to me, but I can live with a sovereign God. I cannot live with the fact that God's arm is too short. If I really believe that accidents happen and that God could do nothing, I would never get out of my bed this morning, in any morning because I would be terrified out of my mind of what would happen to me. I can't live with that kind of God. I can't live with a deity that is weak. And the Bible challenges you. God never apologizes. He is sovereign. See, there are a lot of bad responses we can have, but do you know what Jacob did? He is facing this enormous iceberg in his life. And our text says he offers sacrifices to God. Why? Probably first, to thank God that Joseph is back. But two, he seeks the face of God in prayer. Why? Why do you pray? Because when you're going through pain, You don't need answers. You need focus. God doesn't give us answers in pain. He gives us focus. When Jesus was facing facing the cross, what does he do? He goes off into a garden, and he kneels, and he prays, and he says, God, take this cup from me. I don't like this. I don't want to face the shame of the sins of humanity on me. I don't want to suffer like this, but God, not my will, but yours. And he gets up and he walks away composed and ready to face the cross. When they told Peter to stop preaching in the book of Acts, he calls the church together and they pray and they say it's better for us to obey God than man. When Paul was thrown in jail and beaten for preaching about Jesus. He prayed in the middle of the night and he sang songs of thanksgiving to God in the midst of pain and hardship. He didn't have any answers. He didn't know how long he was going to be there. He didn't know if he was going to die there. He didn't know if he was going to suffer there. All he knew that in that moment, if he wasn't going to get answers, he was just going to pray and trust God with his life. He focuses on God. See, when you go through pain, you don't panic. You pray. You pray along the lines, God, I hate this. What I'm going through stinks. I wish you would change it, and I'm trusting you to change it. But God, you are God. You are with me. You've been so good. I'm trusting you in the middle of this. You know what's amazing about Jacob's life is every time he faced dilemmas in his life, and every time he faced problems in his life, he encounters God. When he was running away from his brother after stealing his brother's birthright, God confronts him with a vision of a ladder that goes up and down from heaven and angels coming up and down. And God let him know that your problems, Jacob, are known by me. I know who you are. I'm with you. And then years later, when Jacob was about to go back and see his brother Esau, God shows up again and gives him another vision. An angel comes down. And they arm wrestle all night. Jacob says, bless me or I won't let you go. And God comforts him again with his presence. And here's the third time that God comes and speaks to Jacob. And here's what Jacob learns. That there is no pit so deep 
that God's grace is not deeper still. He prays. See, the habitat for God's presence in our life is pain. Let me tell you something about my life. Whenever I go through happy times, the fun times, the pleasant times in my life, I praise God for those times. Those make me thank God for his blessings. But when I go through pain, when I go through hardships, when I go through difficulties, that makes me worship God for his presence. My life has been made happy because of God's blessings. My life has been shaped because of God's presence in the midst of pain and hardship in life. I would not trade pain in my life for anything. I would not go through it again for nothing, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. Let me tell you something about you. If all God does is bless you and bless you and bless you, you're going to be a shallow Christian. You're going to have no ground to stand on. But it's when you go through pain, the harmony of your life begins to deepen. How do you go through it? How do you go through those times when you don't know what to do? The Apostle James says it this way, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the seas that is driven and tossed by the wind, for the person must not suppose that he will receive anything from God. There's some of you in this room that your Christian life is doing really good until God tries to deepen you and broaden you. And whenever that happens, you fold and you cry and you complain and you whine and you leave and get angry at God. And then after a season, you come back till God tries to deepen you again. Don't run from it. Listen, all of us in this room are going to face icebergs. God is so merciful that he won't give you more than you can take or handle. And you know, maybe in a lifetime of 70 to 80 years, for most of us, we'll probably go through about 10 years worth of pain. But if you didn't have it, your life would have no depth. Bear Bryant, the old football coach of Alabama, used to tell his players, hey, the game is only about 60 minutes. And in those 60 minutes, it's broken up into four 15-minute quarters. And in those 15-minute quarters, there's only about six minutes of action and exertion that you have to use. Anybody can take anything for six minutes. But without the pain and the icebergs in your life, your Christian life is candy for where you find God the most is in the midst of pain. Now watch what God does to Jacob. Because God begins to speak to Jacob, and he tells him five things which are so powerful. And these are not profound, because this is so characteristic of God. This is who God is. He says to him in verse 2, Jacob, Jacob. Jacob is his name of weakness. The night that Jacob wrestled with the angel throughout the night. God changed his name. And he said, you're no longer Jacob, but you're Israel. What does that mean? You know, I was driving back from Oklahoma City from the funeral yesterday, and me and my wife were talking, and I was running these points through um, asking her what she thought. And I asked, hey, if you were going through a hardship in your life, if you were going through pain, and you heard God come and say, Anne, Anne, or Sam, Sam, what would you think? And she said, I would know who God is. I would know that God knew who I was. God knew where I was. And God knew what I was going through. That's what God says to Jacob. Jacob, Jacob, I know who you are. I know where you are. I know what you're going through. Corrie ten Boom would say that when she was in the death camps of the Nazi Germans, every morning they would line, them, line the prisoners up, and her and her sister were there. And every morning they would line up for roll call. She said that every morning there was this little lark or this little bird that would fly above her and would sing. And she wrote that she felt like this was her own personal bird, and that as she was going through so much pain, 
that God was letting her know that this little lark could sing happily and remind her that God was in charge and he knows where she was and that he will send a bird every morning to sing to her. Listen, if you're going through hardships this morning, the first thing you need to remember is God knows who you are. God knows where you are. God knows what you're going through. There's another point here. In verse 3, he says, I am God. Jacob knew that. But why did God have to say that? I asked Anne again yesterday, if you hear God come and say, I am God, what, is, what do you think God is saying? And she said, that no matter what problem I'm going through right then, I know that God is bigger. God is bigger than all those problems. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he's God? That he's bigger than whatever problem you're facing in life? Charles Spurgeon was probably the prince of all preachers, the most powerful preacher in our day and age. He was in England. Crowds and crowds of people would fill his church every week. But Spurgeon dealt with severe depression his entire life. One day he was reading through Corinthians where it said, my grace is sufficient for you. And Spurgeon just dropped his Bible and he said, God, and he lifted his hand and he said, God, really? Is your grace really sufficient for me? And all of a sudden he just bursted out laughing because God brought an image to his mind of a little goldfish in the middle of the ocean trying to drink gulp by gulp of the Atlantic Ocean and saying, is this ocean ever going to run dry? And the ocean responding, Drink, little guppy. Just keep drinking. God, are you big enough to take care of me? And I can imagine God laughing. Trust, little Sam. Trust, little son. Trust, little daughter. I am strong enough for you. Listen, omnipotent beings are never impressed by finite problems. I'm God. He's big enough to take care of you. He says something else here. I am the God of your father. What does that mean? I'm not just your God. I'm not just watching over you. But I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of Abraham. He's a God of covenant relationship. For he chose Abraham and he told Abraham, I will bless you. I will make you into a great nation. And when God reminds Jacob, hey, I am the God of your father, he's saying, listen, I have given you my word. I am not going to fail you. I don't break my promise. I am faithful. He's the God of covenant relationships. What would happen if God said to me when I'm facing an iceberg, God, Sam, I am the God that chose you from eternity who predestined you to believe, who has worked in your heart to bring you to faith, who has declared you righteous, who will raise you up in glory, and all things will work together for good in your life. I won't give you answers, but I will give you myself. I am sworn to your growth. You know how I would respond? I'd rejoice. I would rejoice. Not in answers but because I know that God is committed to me. Because God is absolutely faithful to me. That's why Paul would say all things work together for good. Not for everybody, but for those who love him. That's how you know you're a follower of Jesus, because of your obedience, who are called according to his purpose. And he goes on, he says, for whom God foreknew, you were on his mind from eternity, for whom God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son to save you, to make you righteous, to raise you up, to be like Jesus one day. Whom he predestined, it's scripture says, he called. And whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, he continues on and on. Every whom in that passage makes it. Every whom he foreknew, he predestined. And everyone he predestined, he called. And everyone he called, he justified. Not one of them is missing. 
Not one of them is lost. God will not do a roll, roll call in heaven and one of his children end up missing because what he started in your life, he is faithful to finish. Do you believe that? When you go through hardships, do you believe that? When you go through difficulties, do you believe that? Jesus said that not one sparrow is forgotten before God, that the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do you believe that God knows how many hairs are on your head? Jesus makes this incredible hyperbole to show just how valuable you are to God. He knows how much hair is on your head. This morning when I was combing my hair and three strands fell off and fell into a sink, I smiled. I was like, the head count in, the count in heaven is changing right now because I've just lost three and God's updating my record. He knows it. He knows exactly. That's an incredible statement of how valuable you and I are to God. Something else in verse 3. He has a higher purpose. Do not be afraid to go to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. Jacob was taking 70 people into Egypt that morning. And for 400 years, his family would live in Egypt. And when they march out at the Exodus, there are 600,000 of them. They never had to worry about famine in Egypt because when they get there, Pharaoh gives them the best of the land in all of Egypt. While the rest of the country suffered, Jacob and his family were taken care of. The land was called Goshen, the most fertile land in all of Egypt. When they were in Egypt, God takes care of them spiritually because God doesn't allow them to have bad associations. God takes care of them militarily because Pharaoh promises to protect them because Joseph found favor in his eyes. He takes care of them geographically and puts them in the finest piece of land and lets this little nation just basically incubate for 400 years. Did Joseph have any idea that this was going to happen when he was sold as a slave? Did Jacob have any idea that this was going to happen when he was moving to Egypt? He had no idea. But God knew. Do you have any idea why you go through pain and hardships and difficulty in your life? You might think you know, but let me tell you, you have no idea. But God does. And he will use it for your, his glory and for your good. He knows exactly what you're going through. One last point. Verse 4 says, I will go down with you to Egypt. You know what words stand out there with me for me? Those words, with you. I will go with you. What's the name of Jesus in heaven? Emmanuel. God with us. What does Jesus tell his disciples before he ascends into heaven? Go into all the world, preach the gospels, and at the end he says, I am with you. What does the writer of Hebrews say to encourage the church in, um, in the church in Rome that was suffering? He says, I will never, 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 never leave you. I will not forsake you. You are mine. See, listen, I can go through any pain or hardship in my Christian life if I know one thing, that God is with me and that God is in control. I don't need to know why I'm going through it. I'd like to know, but I don't need to know. All I need to know is that he is with me. And if I know he's with me, I can go through anything. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? That he knows who you are, where you are, what you're going through. That he is bigger than any problem that you're facing in life. That he is absolutely faithful to his promises. That if he has called you, he will finish what he started in your life. That he has a bigger plan and purpose for your life than what you can see right now. And that he is with you every single step of the way. You know... When I'm going through difficulties, that's the hardest thing to believe. When we look back at it, it's those moments when we realize those are the times when God was the most faithful. 
He is with us. How do I know? Because when we had no solution to the sin problem, he said, I'm bigger. I'll die in your place. He said that when you had no way to heaven on your own, he said, I will come. I will give of my life. I will die the death that you should have died and live the life that you should have lived and so that when I die, all of your sins can be placed on me and when God looks at you, he can look at you as clean, forgiven, accepted. When he looks at me, he can see me filled with all of your sins. I have taken your place. I'm bigger. And I don't just save you, but I don't leave you as well. That because I died, because I resurrected, because I ascended, I now live in you. So that every morning when you wake up, I'm with you. Every day when you go to your jobs, I'm with you. 